This is the StoryWorks Roundtable, where we have conversations about craft. Because becoming a successful author begins with writing a great story. Hello and welcome to this week's StoryWorks Roundtable. Today, Robert, Catherine, and I are going to talk about the importance of reading. But before we do, I've got a couple of announcements. First of all, uh, as I'm sure you know, if you've been listening for more than a week or two, the podcast has recently gone from a weekly show to a bi-weekly show, which left me with the question, what to do in the weeks off? And what I decided, and I'm now doing, is I'm recording writing tips. They're short, sweet, to the point, immediately actionable. They're roughly five minutes long, give or take a minute. And each one is connected to a podcast episode. So the first one of these just came out last week. If you heard it, you know that at the end, I said, if you want to hear more on this topic, go to this episode. There's also a search field in the footer at storyworkspodcast.com. So you can always go to the website, put a topic in that search bar and check out all of the episodes that come up. So I spent the weeks off over the summer preparing for this, getting lots of episodes of the writing tips in the can. And now that it's September, it is launched. I hope you enjoy it. Our Second announcement is a sad one. (laughs) Uh, Robert is going to be stepping away from the show after we record tonight. So we've got about three more episodes with Robert at the round table. We are going to miss him dearly, of course. And if you might be interested or want to recommend somebody to fill that spot on the podcast, we would love to hear from you. So you can email me info at storyworkspodcast.com and let me know. So before we get teary eyed, we're going to record a few episodes and we will <laughs> we will do a proper send off at the end of tonight. But Robert, we're definitely um, happy for you understanding and sorry that we're going to lose you soon. Yep. It's it's all good. It's one all of those good. just changes. Yep. Definitely. Yeah. Yeah. Change is good. So what is our topic? Reading. Reading. Oh yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that was that was a lot of announcements. <laughs> mm. Yes. Yeah, so Catherine, you brought this one up. So why don't you introduce the topic to us? Get us into it. Yeah, I've been thinking a lot lately about reading habits and reading habits of writers specifically because um, I've noticed, especially in my own reading, that I keep getting more and more diverse in what I enjoy and what I'm picking up. And I think as an early writer, I pretty much only read one genre and then for I only wrote one genre, if that makes sense. Um, And I'm finding as I develop as a writer that I needed to read books in this genre in order to enhance this aspect of my writing or this genre in order to really dig into like character or motivation. You know, it's different genres do different things, I think, better, (laughs) right? And you can really glean some really good things from reading widely. And so I wanted to talk about just what that looks like, whether you really can't stand other genres or you only like to read this or, you know, how you can learn to read widely and appreciate it um, as a writer. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. That's such a great, a few things you said really jumped out at me. Um, You know, that you had to go turn to different genres to further develop different aspects of craft. I really want to get into that in a minute. But first, why do people gravitate exclusively toward one genre? I think Mm -hmm. as as readers, we like what we like, right? And then there's the right to market trend as well. And so people are very concerned about genre expectations and tropes and what's going to sell in that genre Mm -hmm. marketplace and such, you know, and I, I was just talking to 
a client a couple of days ago about this. And um, she wants to definitely write to market. And I said, that's great, you know, but if something is weak in the manuscript, my goal for her isn't say, no, you can't have it in there because it's weak, right? It's not to avoid writing to market. It's to say, okay, within the parameters of that genre or those market expectations, how can you make it stronger? Yes, and I think absolutely. what you're saying is by reading widely. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I actually used this example speaking to another writer last night. Um, I was like, uh, if you want to learn to write really meaningful and powerful, she's writing like in a fantasy genre, right? And I said, if you want to learn to write meaningful and powerful sex scenes that aren't just smut, right? Go read some really good romance novels that focus on this is the character's moment. This is the the peak of the romantic plot, right? So it's not about just the action on the page, right? It's about where that character development led to and the interaction and the relationship and it all comes to a peak, right? So that's like, you can take different things that different genres do really well and that you know your genre wants. She was writing new adult fantasy. They want that, right? They want that in the manuscript, but you can learn how to do it really well from the masters who know how to really drive that point home, right? So you can do different things to read and and get yourself into a different mindset, remove it from that setting and really s- focus on what they're doing here. Why is this working so well? Mm-hmm. Well said. Good advice. <laughs> <laughs> Do you read widely, Robert? Yeah, um, yes, in terms of uh, voice, um, I tend to probably read in the same market. So I would, I think there's there's a, a fraught discussion, I think, about genre and, and mm-hmm. where it crosses with markets um, and categories because especially for the independent publishing community, they get caught up in Amazon's categories, which aren't necessarily the same as, in my mind, as genre anyway. You can have a thriller that's set in a fantasy. You can have a love story that's a science fiction story. Mm -hmm. So separating realism from plot characteristics, I think where authors make a mistake is they they say they're going to write a fantasy and they're writing coming of age and, and get confused about what to do. I think there are I mean, they they can be tossed around. You could call them genre conventions or obligatory scenes or, you know, things that readers will probably expect. So you're not going to write a fantasy without some kind of idea that it's an alternative world Mm -hmm. Um, and probably with alternative systems, maybe with magic. Um, And I was talking to my wife about this last night because I'd just given her a book to read and she's a bit confused at the start. And I said, yep, this exactly what happens with this because this particular author and this particular story is drip feeding. You just don't know that mm-hmm. what is this magic? What is this thing that they live in? How does that work? And he's very good at just continuing to, re- you know, reinforce that context compared to, let's say, um, a traditional fantasy author s- style from, say, 50 years ago, where you'll get an awful lot of backstory describing, you know, how the wizards came down from the mountains and bestowed their powers upon the village people. And, mm-hmm. you know, you're several pages in before you actually even meet a main character. Um, they're both fantasy. So mm-hmm. I think so to, it's helpful to explore voice and understand what you like and what you like to write. And both of those are acceptable in the marketplace under fantasy Mm -hmm. because we can't write in a voice that appeals to everybody. But we must, I think we must live up to conventions, story conventions, which comes back to Alita's point, which is, well, okay, you've identified this moment as a, a trope or a convention that these type of readers are probably desperate for, but the way you've written it is really weak in terms of story craft. Yeah. Um, mm-hmm. So let's strengthen that and make it part of the story and make it come to life. And I think this is this is where it all gets conflated, these three things. So you've got mm-hmm. categories in Amazon, which are not the same as genres. Then you've got the real genre, which is the type of story it is, and within that, the setting, the realism. And then you've got tropes, 
which may or may not be important to the, to the genre itself. Mm-hmm. But as Catherine is saying, you know, you might have a trope that is uh, a classic sex scene. Um, and in this particular marketplace that you want to identify like a new adult story, that's expected. So you go, okay, so I've got to do that. I want to do that, but it's not in my wheelhouse. I'll just whack it in, so to speak. <laughs> um, and uh, we've, we've got the comedy episode coming up, folks. Um, we do. And, and so um, where's a good place to look for things like that? We'll study the masterworks. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, who's doing that really, really well? As Catherine so brilliantly said, you'd go to the romance authors. You know, they, they have absolutely, you know, secured how this is done for decades and decades, even the old masterworks, you know, mm-hmm. where it isn't necessarily always explicit on the page. I you've still got the sense face. of, <laughs> yeah, you, you, you've still got this sense of two bodies coming together intimately to express mm-hmm. something as opposed to a mechanical um, uh, yes. um, copulation. So, mm-hmm. I, you know, I think it is important to, to read widely. It's important to understand why, you, why you're doing that and what you're trying to track for as well. So, mm-hmm. yes, I, I do, um, but there are some, I mean, I, it's pretty rare that I'd read a, rom- a straight romance, for example, mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. but I've studied them. So, yeah, I, I, I think, you know, we all get, obviously, you're sort of attracted to a particular style of story and a particular realism setting for a reason that may be buried in our unconscious, you know, some desperate need for me to fly to another end of the universe. I don't know. <laughs> that's why I read science fiction. I don't know. You know, there's something obviously that stimulates. So that's, I, I'm, I don't think we should put that to one side because I think that's that's the driving voice ultimately of your own driving motivation of your own unique voice and, yeah. and how we how we execute but um but certainly reading outside of that for craft reasons i think is is key mhm yeah and i think it's important too that we find the text that has the example we need when we're looking for something very specific right mm-hmm. like the yeah. Yeah. sex scene that goes in the fantasy book or something that is going to give us quality. Mm -hmm. So go to, you know, readers blogs or ask your friends, do a poll, whatever, but find recommendations from people for that book. Cause if I, if I said, for example, oh no, no, I'm going to have to go to the library, just pull a bunch of random romances off the (laughs) shelf. Cause that's not my (laughs) genre of choice. And yeah, like the odds of it would be the needle in the haystack problem. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And that would kill the genre for me because I would end up frustrated. You know, and I think reading literary fiction or contemporary fiction, you know, whether whichever direction is, can serve so much of this purpose for us because you can have contemporary fiction with magic realism or with Mm -hmm. romance or Mm -hmm. with, um, you know, a paranormal element, or there's so many different things that are aspects of contemporary and literary fiction that don't launch them into a different genre, but you can find great dialogue or great sex scenes or a great fight scene or a great, right? So if you Robert, you were talking about Amazon categories and that had me thinking, well, of course, because it's digital, you know, so you can have a book in 20 categories and really, really narrow it down to try to get the sales rank up. But if you were in a brick and mortar bookstore, you can't have those categories because you can't divvy up your bookshelf and have a category of two books. You know, you need to have the science fiction section and the fantasy section and the, you know, cookbook section. So you've got a lot to browse on one shelf with one label and such. Mm -hmm. And so when you think about reading in your genre and finding different styles and voices, different subsets or reading across genres, it can be helpful to think wide, Mm -hmm. you know like with contemporary or even with something like science fiction, 
If you went to a brick and mortar bookstore and started picking up things and browsing, I bet it wouldn't take more than 15 minutes to find something palatable enough to enjoy reading it, Mm -hmm. even if that's not your genre. Yeah. And I think people get caught up in like the trappings of genre that they forget that they're really looking for the feeling of a story. So they might say, you know, oh, I, I only read fantasy, but really what they love about it doesn't have to be fantasy. Like yep. I've I've discovered that I really love big sweeping character development stories where they are just like it's so deep into the motivation and the psyche of this character and just this growth and you can see and oh man like I will read those all day long. So <laughs> it doesn't matter if it's historical or fantasy or science fiction or contemporary or literary like if it's got a great character that goes through hell And comes out the other side with this amazing, like deep change. I'm in, I'm in. Right. And so there's, I can find a story like that no matter what the genre is. Yeah. And so my, my point in that is that that's actually not genre we're talking about. Right. Exactly. uh, You're, you're you're talking and yeah, in the classic sense of, of what you're talking about in terms of type of story, it is what we would call genre, but genre has been misappropriated to become just a category. And as you Mm -hmm. say, Alita, that's, it's, you're spot on with the, you know, Amazon splits it all up and divvies it into tiny chunks, which is fantastic in a way, but also can lead to, and I think this comes right back to Catherine's point where, if you get to tunnel vision on a very, very small Amazon category, for example, and think it's a genre and want to write to that, you can miss some of the innovation that can happen sideways because there's somebody in literary doing that particular thing really, really well. Mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. And, and so I think Innovation is probably why we continue to read in certain genres because you you know I mean people read romance they know what's going to happen you read in science fiction I know there's going to be something that's you know off in the stars if it's fancy we know there's going to be some cool magic but you don't necessarily pick it up for that as Catherine said you pick it up because there's a story buried in there um, and our job i think as writers is to is to innovate that and you can do that by feeding yourself lots of different um story types mm-hmm. um even if it's within the same genre so you might you know you might uh, same sorry same category or setting <laughs> so right. it's it's so muddled it really is and and i would caution anybody to say well i'm writing to market and it's this genre it's not a genre you're identifying an amazon category that you're writing mm-hmm. to Mm-hmm. But be very clear right. what your story is. Yes. Mm-hmm. Yes. Yeah. And I think, you know, shopping on Amazon, buying our books online fuels this problem because then we've got bots tracking algorithms and they say, oh, you've bought two or three books that fit, you know, this subset of subsets of subset of way down there in super narrow category. And so that's what they keep showing you what the you might also likes. But if you walk into a bookstore and you browse and you've got the little cards by the employees and you hear why somebody likes something and you're touching covers and you're looking at page count and you're skimming a bit, it's not the same as, you know, having a bot show you something you might like. And then within what the bot shows you, you can look at the covers and you can open the previews But think how much that narrows the world available to us. You know, Catherine, you're laughing. (laughs) (laughs) It's like uh, my husband and I are always laughing about this. Like Netflix is the same problem, right? I will see 80 movies and my husband's account shows him a completely different 80 movies and you can't find anything else. It won't show you anything else, right? Unless you know what you're searching for, like literally by title, like you can't, you can't find it. They just don't even bother showing it to you. And Amazon's the same problem, right? They're going to keep feeding you exactly what they think you're going to purchase, which is becomes an echo chamber, right? There's no outside feedback. So this is why I started just checking out the library's book of the month for a while, just to kind of get myself out of this echo chamber of keeping getting recommendations over and Mm -hmm. over and over again. I think this is brilliant. Yeah, I, yeah. I can. When um, when I lived in back in Sydney, so this will be now um, 
probably twenty say twenty five years ago when when video stores were still a thing, um, and we had this brilliant independent video store just around the corner, and they just had these post it notes you know below this sort of a curated section and we saw so many fantastic films that we would never have picked up otherwise so Catherine's right you know you some sense of curation that's not by an algorithm can really introduce you to something different and all of a sudden you've found a new author and you're devouring everything they've ever written um, and that still happens to me today I mean we can't possibly read everything that's available to us mm -hmm. um, and I can remember when I was 13 maybe and i started really finding my my way in the library i mean i think i read the entire science fiction in our little section in our little library um but i would do exactly what alita says i'll pull a book off the shelf and i would flick open and see if i liked the the style right it, mm -hmm. it wasn't really about you know Oh, you know, uh, Ashley suddenly found herself transported through a portal to a different planet. I know I'm opening the book and, you know, has Ashley got some good sense of identity? Am I identifying with this? Is this a story for me? Um, so I guess that's a different mm -hmm. world we live in now. You know, how do you hit that mark? And we could go back to episodes about, you know, your book books opening, the clearer that your you're stating the the premise of the story and what the main characters is is, is expected to experience in the start of your story is probably mm -hmm. even more important these days because of the the look inside and sample stuff. Yep, mm -hmm. it is. Yeah, and if you think about books that made it into film and then the film explodes, you know, like The Princess Bride has come to mind and. How many people would never think to pick up this fantasy, fairy tale, funny, quirky book with a mm -hmm. framing device of this kid being read to? But boy, you know, the movie like reached millions and millions of people and turned the story into a sensation. So if we only think, oh, that's that fantasy thing. I don't go there. Mm -hmm. What are we missing out on? Right? Exactly. We could argue, I suppose, Harry Potter did the same thing for, you know, young adult magic and, and, and brought a whole raft of authors into, so, you know, oh, I want to write something like that, you know, and you've got all these, now we've got all these academy books and it, it's, it's just, triggered a whole new thing because people mm -hmm. started reading and the talk at the time when when Harry Potter came out, oh young people are reading again mm-hmm yes yeah so we've kind of gotten away from talking about how reading widely <laughs> improves our craft <laughs> sorry Catherine <laughs> no it's okay it's okay I just I've just been reading some really great books lately like really I like just super enjoyable different very different in terms of their craft style and yet um, something that I maybe wouldn't have picked up five years ago. And so I know that I've evolved as a reader. And because of that, I know that I've evolved as a writer. Mm. Like I mm. can feel it. Like I don't sit down on a page and immediately think about what's the next wow thing I can have happen here. And where does the magic fit in? Right. I'm thinking about, okay, like what's the character interplay here and how can I really deepen this or, Ooh, let's play around with structure here and things that I wouldn't have thought about if I hadn't mm -hmm. been reading these books. Right. Right. So, yeah. Yeah. Yes. And, you know, if you think about any genre, the stories that become part of the canon, that live mm. on, that become popular mm. outside their niche, mm. those are the ones that do these things well. Like the fantasy mm -hmm. that's not just about the magic system, but that is about right. the character's development and arc and the, you know, the yeah. beautiful heart moving romance, you know, subplot within the, so yeah, I mean, you are making a beautiful case for reading widely <laughs> as writers and really right, exactly. studying the aspects of, of what is being done well in any book you read. Mm -hmm. Yeah. There you go. Thank you for listening to the StoryWorks Roundtable. Find all our shows, show notes, and videos at storyworkspodcast.com. <laughs>